because it fixes a broken system, we affirm that U.S. law should make it illegal to publish classified information concerning the intelligence activities of the United States. Our first argument is about information sharing. James Bruce of the CIA writes that press disclosures make foreign governments and individuals reluctant to share information with the United States as they are not certain that they can trust America with their classified information. However, foreign policy explains that diplomatic and intelligence cooperation between nations is vital to U.S. national security as information sharing between nations betters the government's ability to track security threats. This will materialize as Tom Rogan of the National Review explains Middle Eastern nations are not likely to trust America with their classified information in light of leaks. Eric Rosenbach of Harvard University impacts that intelligence support is crucial to inform policymaking, counterterrorist efforts, and military operations. This is because international partners have access to information that is not readily available to the United States, and without them on our side, we would not know the full picture of any story. Our second argument is about national security. So point A is intelligence gathering. Mary Kelly of NPR writes, but the U.S. government has lost track of about 1,000 terrorist groups since 2013. This is because, as James Meek of ABC finds, the terrorist groups have looked at leaked information and adjusted their operations to avoid surveillance. Terrorists now have full sight at the tools and techniques employed by the government. Leaking U.S. intelligence programs gives the enemy our playbook, and when terrorists know how we plan to fight them, they can more easily avoid how we plan to fight them. Subpoint B is overcompensation. As terrorist groups shift their strategy, so must the United States. However, leaking classified information causes government officials to be fearful of its potential effects to our national security. As a result, Tyler Cohen of George Mason University writes that the government often feels it must resort to direct military action to compensate for its perceived loss in security. Indeed, after the Snowden revelations, Spencer Ackerman of The Guardian explains in 2014 that the U.S. doubled down on U.S. troop levels overseas and consequently continued the use of drone strikes in terrorist-based regions. In fact, U.S. counterterrorism has been degraded since classified materials have been leaked. As Rosa Brooks of Foreign Policy indicates, in 2014, U.S. counterterrorism strategies rest on questionable assumptions and risks increasing instability and escalating conflict. The United States becomes rash in its decision-making when it feels that it has lost control, and leaks give the perception that government has lost control. Our third argument is about media madness. In the current political sphere, Jacob Roberts of the Southern California International Review notes that media outlets are solely motivated by profit and thus focus only on issues that will gain them the most attention. Regarding leaks specifically, John Herman of the New York Times indicates leaks are front page stories for media outlets. As a result, Alex Kingsbury of U.S. News writes that news organizations will publish leaked classified information regardless of its validity or effects because it makes them the most money. This has three major impacts. First, it warps public policy. David Posen of Columbia University explains that government officials feel compelled to focus all of their attention on leaks because a perceived failure to act is politically costly. As a result, politicians exercise an enormous amount of political capital in an attempt to appease the public's policy positions that were brought about by a biased media. But second, it warps public discourse. The Columbia Journalism Review indicates that news outlets often release selective information in favor of their own ideologies to promote their own political agenda. When the media controls the narrative of what can be seen and heard, Matthew Lewandowski of Penn State University finds that it increases political polarization by 44%. A more polarized citizenry, or more polarized citizenry stifles public policy, as Nolan McCarty of Princeton University finds that factionalism increases governmental gridlock, inhibiting positive policy from taking shape. But third, it decreases trust in the political system. When news organizations decide to publish first and verify later, it causes public opinion to unjustly shift away from favoring the government. As NPR notes, only 19% of Americans trust the government currently. This loss in political trust also has long-term consequences, as the OECD in 2013 explains that without trust in government, support for necessary reforms is difficult to mobilize, where short-term sacrifices are involved and long-term gains are less tangible. And because the perception of our government dictates its effectiveness, Perry Blind of the UN writes that political trust is the motor of good governance. Thus, Atticus and I are proud to affirm. Thank you. Uh, for, for Yeah, we'll, he can say we will give it, uh, we'll give it to him sometime. Yeah, you won't take a change like that. No, but uh, before I begin my constructive, I would like to thank a lot of people who have helped me throughout my debate career. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the local host, Louisville, the city of Louisville, for hosting the NCFL Grand National Tournament. It has been a pleasure to stay in the city. It's definitely been very important. Uh, in addition, I'd like to thank every judge, competitor, and volunteer that I've ever interacted with or has ever contributed to the activity before or when I, when I was participating in the activity. Definitely enriches the activity and it's an experience I will probably never forget. 
Uh, now to some more personal thank yous. I'd like to thank first my parents for supporting me in doing debate because without their support, I truly would not know what I what I would get into because it's truly a life defining activity. In addition, I'd like to thank my coach, Mr. Harrow, because after my freshman year, our team was in disarray, and he did probably the most remarkable job in turning our team around and creating a very organized framework in order to make sure every kid could succeed. And we are definitely really thankful for that. I'd also like to thank my public forum coach, Bilal, because <laughs> through, through the good and the bad, through the arguments and the fun times, it's definitely been it's definitely one of the most formative relationships I've ever experienced because you've been like a mentor to me, and I really, really appreciate that. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank my partner, Sam. I know this year always hasn't been the easiest because of various difficulties, but I can say with great confidence that there's no one else I'd like coming up here after me to give that love. <laughs> Our sole contention is protecting democracy. David Rudenstein of the Cardozo Law School explains that affirming would alter the unspoken agreement between press and government, making the press the defendant rather than the leaker, which shuts down the free flow of information. The importance of the media in American democracy is underlined by Sutta Shetty in the New England Law Review, writing that leaks alone do not keep the intelligence community accountable. It is necessary that consistent and rigorous press coverage coexist alongside them, as that is the only mechanism in which citizens gain knowledge between the government. In short, Jennifer Robinson of the University of Sydney explains that leaks in their coverage are the difference between a democracy and an authoritarian society. The risk of being found out by elites makes those in authority think twice about telling lies, performing their duties sloppily, behaving corruptly, or gaming the system. Pushing the free press into a defensive posture has three dangerous implications for American democracy. First, losing leaks, which are critical, critical for accountability. James Norris of the Case Western Law Review writes that many of the government's most questionable policies have been revealed by leaks of classified material. Absent those leaks, it is safe to say that abusive practices, such as the warrantless wiretapping and prisoner torture, would still continue today. Norris furthers, while a certain degree of secrecy is necessary, the problem we face today is too much of it. He writes that the need to protect the media in instances in which they disseminate classified information in the course of revealing infringements upon rights is evident. Rebecca Schoenfield of the Witherspoon Institute continues, by taking legal action against the press, we face the ineradicable, ineradicable potential for the misuse of secrecy to obscure competence and promote illicit ends. In essence, he posits that closed doors are incubators for corruption and enable units of, governments to, units of government to depart from the confines of the law. Second, losing leaks diminishes discourse. Bruce Fain of William & Mary writes that America's democracy depends in large measure on public access to information on the government, on government practices or policies. In an affirmative world, Public access is virtually eliminated. Find furthers that the public discussion of governmental policies enables the electorate to form opinions regarding whether public officials should stay in office or particular practices should continue. Absent access to classified information, the public lacks the knowledge to have adequate discourse surrounding policy, which is why secrecy in the government's tendency to cycle discourse is fundamentally undemocratic. Third, losing leaks harms, uh, losing leaks harms governmental legitimacy. Empirically, less transparency delegitimizes the government. Michael Twing of UC San Diego finds that secrecy in the federal government has served to undermine the core sources of legitimacy that lay at the heart of our democracy. Susan Hennessy of the Brookings Institution corroborates, finding that leaks ease burdensome and unnecessary secrecy restrictions to mitigate issues of public trust. For this reason, Alex Ginsberg of the Congressional Research Service explains that the rise of access to information a government information has changed public perceptions regarding government operations and has increased trust in government by increasing access to records and information. By making it illegal to publish classified information, you reduce the sense of government transparency. Problematically, an OECD report notes that the capacity to implement policy primarily depends on trust. Without trust in government, support for necessary reforms is virtually impossible to mobilize. They conclude that trusting government by citizens is essential for effective and efficient policy making. 
The end impact of this government secrecy is an erosion of good governance. As James Barkley of the Naval Postgraduate School writes, excessive secrecy has significant consequences for national interests because policymakers are not fully informed, the government is not held accountable for its actions, and the public cannot engage in an informed debate. It is for this reason that Jonathan Peters of the Columbia Journalism Review writes that the number one threat to free expression of the press in the status quo is government secrecy. Vote for freedom, vote for democracy, vote for negative. Is everyone right? When the government commits an injustice or breaks the law, how do the citizens hold them accountable? Well, a lot of times what happens is there could be whistleblowers that occur that do it through non, you know, leaking classified information routes, so that's one way to do it. But I would also say a lot of the time it doesn't need a classified information okay. in order to see an so injustice. So can you give an example of a non-classified information route? When, okay, I mean, there's the Whistle, whistle protection, uh, protection Act, I think it was in 2016. Whistleblower Protection Act? Yeah, in 2016, okay. I believe it was. So how does, the, how does that enforce? Who's that enforced by? The government. The government. Yeah. So you're telling me the access of information in a pro world is going through the government. Why do they have an incentive then to self-expose I mean, any sort of wrongdoing? the government is such a terrible thing, then we no, shouldn't I, like that's not right thing. I think the government should be held accountable when it does yeah. their terrible yeah. things. And, and, and I would also say under the Whistle Protection, uh, Protection Act of 2016, it outlines the different sections of the government we'll be checking back on sections that are potentially corrupt. So it's not just like them investigating themselves like you're trying to make it sound. I mean, it's, it, it was implemented in 2016, you know, it hasn't had a lot, whole lot of time to like come you know, to fruition fully yet, okay. so no, I mean, all so of it you in may be right, but that's still government agencies regulating other government agencies. <laughs> At the point where they have, it's government control over the information that's being like, sent out to the public, that's very clearly influencing I mean, public like, mindset, Obviously right? that's your argument, and Atticus is going to respond to that, so can I ask you a question? I mean, you can respond to it too. Okay, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Okay, so in your second argument about public discourse, if the public discourse is polarized and uninformed, is it negative? All right. I think here is a very important comparative to answer. First is the answer. First is the idea that in the AF world, there's no information because it's so secret. There's For no instance, media. we wouldn't know about NSA surveillance tactics that Snowden revealed there's if no we media. were living in the pro world. But more importantly, even if discourse is polarized, it's not necessarily for us as the debaters to determine, like, you should have this view, you should have this view, you shouldn't have that extreme view, you should come to the Senate. I mean, it's we not for us to determine. I, we argue that matter access to free information outweighs what you're saying. I mean, we tell you that when you have polarization, you have gridlock in Congress and gridlock in the government. So even if you think that a polarized view is a better better view than okay. other views, so let's it talk still about, causes less policy yeah, to Yeah, let's talk about policy crafting. Okay. Give me this analysis in your third contention that basically polarization reduces the effectiveness of policy, yeah. right? Media coverage. What's the alternative to having media co coverage of policy? What happens? I mean, what we say, what we say is that when classified information is public, because that's what our argument is specific to, right? That type of that that line of argumentation only only causes the media to be rushing different stories to the press. Right. So What's it's the, the alternative to that. The, I argue that the alternative to that is that. The government, especially intelligence officials, are allowed to craft policies without the values of Americans in mind. For instance, I mean, Guantanamo Bay. The reason why the Bush administration was able to continue that and have such terrible practices was because they limited the information that the public knew. This so even if it is polarized, it's still on both sides. I would say that, that access to information to. is better than access to no information. I mean, you're saying that there's no information, but that's not what happens in the poor world. The media still exists, so don't paint, don't try and paint this picture that the media just goes away altogether. Right, but we have no way to hold the government accountable because we don't know what they're seeing. Uh, you so. asked that was the first question you asked, and I showed you how you can still count, hold the government accountable. Yes, sir.
of cells, they said a bunch of thank yous. I'll be very brief. I like you cells. You're pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it home? You guys ready? Before we dive into the specifics of life in this case, let's have a bit of an overview. Something for you to consider before you evaluate any of their arguments. Every single argument they make is talking about the complete erosion of the press within America. Recognize that if you affirm the resolution, what happens is you get rid of highly specified, highly specific information, that is classified information, regarding the intelligence activities of the United States, mainly like terrorist operations, terrorist communications. We're not completely eroding the press. There is still press check back on good governance. Keep that in mind throughout today's radar. It's about intelligence activities. Let's start with their first contention where they talk about democracy. With this Robertson Carver, they say, leaks is the difference between authoritarian government and democracy. Literally, the, the evidence does not at all say authoritarian governments and democracy. They misconstrue that part. Secondly, it doesn't specify intelligence leaks or classified information. Just because leaks may tell the difference, we still have leaks in our world. It's just not of classified information, of intelligence activities. That's critical because that harms our national security. Now let's go to their first argument about accountability. First of all, leaks do not lead to truthful information about the government. This is our third argument under our third contention, basically. But John Billington there of Forbes finds that news sources only publish selected information, especially in America, which ends up misconstruing the government's activities. This leads to public to this leads the public to like false witch hunt, false witch hunts, like false protests, which completely like destroys accountability in the United States. In fact, we saw this completely media blowing up the process in 2016 with the BuzzFeed dossier, which was classified information but was completely unsubstantiated, and it took headlines for days. That's the kind of world that we live in. The pro that's the kind of world that we live in in the convoluted media to just publish all sorts of unsubstantiated claims. Secondly, David Kramer of the Harvard Business Review explains that complete government transparency is entirely dangerous. We say this is important because when you're forced to weigh between the two impacts, if we win national security and they say, well, a very minute amount of accountability that they win because it's classified information of intelligence activities, right? Very minute amount. We say if you're forced to weigh between those two arguments, you should always pick national security because it is national security which protects the lives of individuals. These lives are the most important impact of today's made around because they're irreversible and they lead to other rights that the people have. My third response to this is that fortunately you will not have to choose between these two impacts that I just presented, even though we would say, oh wait, you don't have to choose between them because the Washington Post explains that in the status quo there are whistleblower protection laws that actually allow for reform to occur within the government. They might say, well look, whistleblower protection laws don't actually work, but recognize that after 2013 when Everett Stone implemented whistleblower protection laws, implemented like all these leaks. There was 2014 where the whistleblower protection laws were implemented and as a result we say this is a completely new reformation of the government. It still allows for like reform. Fourth of all, you're going to turn this argument because individuals like who want, who are whistleblowers and want to leak information, they will still go to foreign publications. This is really critical. Before we get into it, they might say that this might not unique our entire case. We say this will not unique our entire case because leaks will still go down because a lot of whistleblowers still want to check back against the United States government and strict scrutiny laws according to the Harvard Law Review, ensure that like the United States applies good leaks and not bad leaks. But foreign publications will receive leaks in, this, in, in the in the in the pro <coughs> world. This is crucial because foreign publications are far better than American media co corporations. This is true because Schechter of MIT explains that foreign media is more diverse than American media and it allows for more discussion on issues as opposed to America's polarized news outlets. At the end of the day, if you really want to check back on good governance, you can just push the media over to foreign publications and if foreign publications are better, that's a reason to vote for us. Let's go to their second point where they talk about discourse. First of all, societal discourse doesn't matter because if it doesn't link back to public policy, that's the impact that they link to. We win public policy on a couple reasons. First of all, because we prove that the media is a really bad thing because they control the narrative of what people hear and see. The Columbia Journalism Review explains that the media is currently hyping up all sorts of activities and they make the perception of government distorted. But secondly, United States decision making is completely undermined of basically our sub point B. Our foreign policy is completely bad because we are like way more trigger happy in the world where leaks are just occurring like left and right. The third argument they talk about legitimacy. Recognize that we're talking about, again, a very small set of information. And in fact, the New York Times reported literally two days ago that the United Kingdom has the very same same law that Pro is trying to advocate for, and literally, we do not see the same sort of trust backlash that we talk about, credibility backlash. The United Kingdom restricts publishing. We don't see the same harm, thus affirm.
Uh, so before I get into my rebuttal, uh, Harish covered most of my sentiments about how I feel about my coaches, uh, Chris Harrow of Bilal, but I'd also like to extend my thank you to everyone who came here to participate in the City of Louisville for hosting this tournament, uh, my parents also for their never-ending support in my debate career. Uh, debate really changed me as a person, so I'm glad that I could be here in front of all of you today so I can kind of be able to demonstrate that because I feel like I've grown a lot because of this. Uh, and then Harish, I couldn't have done any of this without you. Uh, Let's start off with my opponent's first contention about information sharing. Recognize this is patently false because right now we do not rely on other countries for information. The roles are flipped. What Perry of the Seattle Times tells us is that the United States intelligence is of quote the utmost gold standard. What that means is foreign countries rely on us to provide them with the intelligence, not vice versa. That is confirmed by the former Prime Minister of Canada, Tony Abbott, who reports that the United States does quote the majority of the heavy lifting in the international intelligence community. We provide intelligence to other countries and they that benefits them. Very rarely do we see that we rely on other countries for intelligence and explicitly, even more so, the impact here is that we are cut off. First, they never reach a probability of what we will be cut off from. Even more so, they will not be able to provide you a single instance in which a country has indefinitely cut us off from their intelligence. They will only be able to provide you about a week-long span of when they blacked us out from their intelligence. But what we would contend is we're okay with that in our world, that week-long lack of intelligence, because in their world, our citizens lack access to intelligence for a lifetime. That comparison is much worse. Even more so, recognize there's no terminal impact because it only exists in the short term. Let's move on to the second contention about security. First, recognize what they're talking about. We already addressed in the status is, quote, the Supreme Court ruled in Hague v. Aggie that publishing anything that directly harms national security is illegal. Therefore, what they're talking about is already solved back for. They now have to show you a unique reason for why we need to further restrict the press. Even more so, turn this argument against them because Quoka of the University of Denver tells us that in systems with high transparency, the propensity for truly damaging large leaks to, to occur, such as the ones that they condemn in this contention, decreases. What this means is comparatively in their world when you affirm and you decrease government transparency, you increase the propensity for these truly damaging leaks to occur. Quoka explains the reasoning for this writing that leaks target laws that are perceptually unfair. So when you decrease transparency, you increase the perceptual unfairness and you therefore increase the chance that truly damaging leaks occur and those are the only leaks that actually trigger their impacts. Therefore, you can turn all of their impacts against them because in our world, we keep transparency high by allowing for systematic small leaks that continuously check the government. Whereas in their world, we close our doors off onto the people, which increases perceptual unfairness, which increases the propensity of truly large leaks to occur. Those large leaks are the only way they link into their impacts, and since they get worse in their world, you turn this entire contention against them. But really quickly, on their subpoint A about intelligence, first recognize it's certainly not true. Hussein of the Intercept reports, a maraud of studies have concluded that, that leaks have no impact on national security. The reasoning for this comes from Goldsmith of Harvard, who writes, journalists don't publish damning things because they don't want blood on their hands. They do not want to be able to be they don't want to be able to be directly tied to terrorists winning a battle. That's why Hester of the North Carolina Dog Law Journal explains that these medias undergo a sense of self-censorship that precludes the need for government censorship right there. Even more so, there's subpoint B. It's about this idea of overcompensation. Recognize this only exists in the short term. You can focus on the long term, where we tell you in our case that leaks provide accountability for the government. And as a result, Norris finds that leaks directly enable policy change. So in the short term, we might increase our military presence. But in the long term, he finds that leaks provide us with the justification to solve back by Removing bad politicians from office, even more so recognize, turn this against them, because it's patently not true. Green of Salon reports that the only reason we ever pulled out of the Iraq war was because leaks revealed our human rights abuses and our persistent malpractice in the area. Now, their third contention is all about media. First, recognize on face some information in our world is better than no information in their world. Then, you can turn this against them, because in their world, you raise the threshold for what publishers are willing to publish, because they now have to do the decision calculus if a story is big enough to risk the prison time. We would contend that only incentivizes larger leaks people published. Then, even more so, recognize media doesn't get information in their world. The only recourse they give you is whistleblowers. But what the fundamental mis the, fundal, un the fundamental misassumption in this argument is that they expect the government to self-expose their wrongdoings to the people, something they have literally never done in the past. Only leaks do that. Then, on the impact level, their first impact that concedes that leaks, that leaks prompt reform. Their second impact is all about discourse. Recognize that media sensationalization exists on both sides, so we would contend those impacts offset each other. The third is all about trust. Recognize transparency is intrinsically tied to trust, because when people don't trust, when secrets are exposed, in the long term, we solve back for this by increasing, uh, by increasing reform, which they themselves tell you happens as a result. Look to their first impact. Thus, I urge you to engage.
We see two cards. We see Boko and Green. How about like the Iraq War? Yeah. Just um, before my summary. Yeah. yeah. Like I guess we those ready. Yeah. And then we'll see them. Mm -hmm. Alright. Yeah. Yeah. So what it does is if the United States has 99% of the information they need, you now have to show the judges why that loss of the 1% of information somehow outweighs the erosion of our democracy. Yeah, now the let's talk about impact yeah, yeah, so let's talk about your overview. You say that we talk about the complete erosion of the press. Yes. You do. Wouldn't you agree? Well no. Wouldn't you agree that if the press has nothing to report on, they no longer serve as a check on the government? Nothing to report on. That, like I'm not saying I'm not I'm not saying that's what happens in your world. I'm asking the question. If the press has nothing to report on, don't they no longer become a check on the government? I'm not, I'm not saying that happens in your world per se. I'm just asking the question. Yeah, if the press can't do anything. The so, press. so if the press lacks the information, they no longer become a sustainable check on the government. This is all I'm saying. Perfect. Is now, do you have a question you want to ask? I know that was like a leading question. You literally said in your last rebuttal, quote, like verbatim, it's better to have like information in our world than no information because the press doesn't have it. That is like a complete falsification of the pro Why? side. The What's pro so side disseminates like cuts off classification of intelligence activities that is mainly like our operations with terrorists. We say that the public should not know about so like, what is the how we try and stop What is the mechanism in which the press receives information in an affirmative world? Um, there's a, a couple of ways. I think you, leaks still you guys, occur. You said, like, one, you said one specific one in first crossfire, and then you said one specific one in your well, well, answer to my question the, the was whistleblowers. Well, yeah, and the problem is... Protection laws so that. But, but listen, your 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 jargon's a little like poor here. You're, you're saying, how does the press like respond the press is going to respond to other stuff, not just, just not intelligence activity. See, like, I think you're misunderstanding There's leaks still occur, it's just not no. with intelligence What activity. I'm saying... Yes, whistleblower protection laws. So, are. with whistleblowers, whistleblowers go to the government. And even if the government solves that problem, you are then expecting the government to say, hey, this problem was brought to us, we might or might have not fixed it, but we've been making mistakes. In the history of our country, has the government ever self-exposed its wongdoings? It won't. It, it won't self-expose its wrongdoings. Okay. Press, if it doesn't self-expose its wrongdoings, then the press gets okay. no information. For example, world. if we have intelligence operations that determine where Al Qaeda members are, or ISIS members are, that should not be known by the public. And right? there, so we don't need that not information. By the public. Now, if there are operations, it's not. Which, that, wait, listen, it's not listen, known by the public. Listen, I, that's why I tell you my rebuttal. But listen, how is it not known? Because Goldsmith of Harvard finds that journalists systematically self-censor themselves because they don't want the blood on their hands. Well, see, we would say that's obviously not true. We say Snowden harmed our national security. That's probably true. Because no, of, that's Hussein directly finds that post-Snowden leaks okay. there was no so, harm hold to hold national on, security. I think that's like like logically and I understand the logic, works. but outside the vacuum tell, of debate, if you, you need tell, to look at the real world. If the world. United States the citizens didn't know that they were being surveilled on, I would say the terrorist operations probably didn't know so much. We're gonna win like the war in there.
five months after it. Gentlemen, you go to to respond to a little bit of opponent's rhetoric in rebuttal he gets up here and he tells you that it's better for the media to report on some things than no things at all but remember that's not the pro advocacy all the pro does is stop a very slim margin of classified information sharing about the intelligence activities of the united states the media still can report on other types of classified information with that let's get into the reasons why you can feel comfortable voting for the pro side in today's world remember the turn that Atticus puts on their case in rebuttal just because they're not leaking in domestic uh, in, to domestic media they can still be leaking to foreign media and it's sort of conceded in my opponent's uh, in my opponent's argument when they talk about this quote Card saying that leaks are going to increase, and I'll respond to that a little bit in the future. But they say the leaks are going to increase, and there's no reason to believe that those leaks won't increase to foreign media. And this is really important because if we show you that foreign media is actually better than domestic media, because domestic media is more polarized. They have more stake. They have more stake in the process, so they have more stake in the outcome. And when they have more stake in the outcome, they're more likely to try and favor a particular outcome. That's really important because we tell you from our evidence that with, when you have foreign media, they're less polarized, and they present, they're less biased, and they present a clearer picture. You can vote for us based on foreign media because the domestic media is more sensational than foreign media. Now, the next reason you can feel comfortable voting for the affirmative side is on the idea of info sharing. He gets up here and he tries to tell us that the United States still has the best information uh, information analysis in the world. But that's critical because it still needs other types of information. He only tells you that it does the heavy lifting, but someone has to be able to do the light lifting. And that's really critical because the types of countries that do the light lifting are very essential to helping the United States uh, when it's, with its intelligence gathering. In fact, uh, right before the second Gulf War, Germany sort of redacted some information that it was going to share with the United States. And the United States took action on that and sort of spurred more conflict in the region. That's critical because it shows you that even if it isn't long-term stuff, Stopping of intelligence gathering, short-term stopping of intelligence gathering, still causes the United States to do certain things that it wouldn't otherwise do if it had the intelligence. But this has happened more than just with Germany. It's happened with the UK just three days ago. We, uh, it also happened with Pakistan, France, Germany, uh, uh, and all other Middle Eastern countries. We have more information sharing with other countries, and that's a better thing. On our second contention, talking about our sub point B, really quickly to respond to this Coco card. He talks about Coco and says that Coco is uh, talking about damaging links. All Coco talks about leaks in general, not necessarily intelligence leaks. But he also indicts himself when he says that journalists don't want to leak information because they don't want blood on their hands. That indicts Coco himself, but on a subject B about overcompensation, Patrick Reagan of Binghamton University tells you that when you have overcompensation, it decreases it increases the probability of war by 1,000%. Thank you. While we're prepping, can we see the 1,000% war thing? Yeah. There we go. It's the length. The length of conflict. It's the length of conflict. You still want to see it? It just, like, it wasn't a case, right? <laughs> So first, I'm just going to talk about framework. Then I'm going to give you two reasons to vote for the amendment. This everyone knows. You guys know. So we'll begin the two reasons as to why you're voting negative. Realize that the prerequisite to security in this case is accountability. Here's why. First off, the United States already has a large amount of security. The only thing that matters now is how we use that security to foster policy. That's why we say that accountability to the people is more important. But in order for security to matter, we argue the importance of security is derived from the government actually having accountability to the people, or else security wouldn't matter. That's why it's important. That's going to be the critical weighing analysis of today's round. But with that, even if you don't buy that, we're going to show you why we're winning under either issue. First on the idea of national security. Realize they never respond to the Perry evidence, which says that we have the gold 
standard information of intelligence. The reason why other countries don't severe their intelligence relationships with us is because we have all the intelligence that they need to ensure their national security. That's why they'll never have any sort of long-term impact. You can completely mitigate this argument here. It's not a threat to security. Then they give you this idea about uh, intelligence gathering. But realize Sam gives you these very important responses that he doesn't respond to versus Haig versus Aggie, which says that uh, when, when information directly threatens national security, it is actually already illegal to publish. So you don't need to take this overstep, uh, uh, this measure that the affirmative has to completely uh, criminalize all publication of classified information when the most important information is already protected. You don't need to affirm here. Then we give you the idea of the uh, quota analysis. He says it's like, it doesn't work, uh, it's like non unique because other, like, we, we other people will, uh, will leak information. But the important thing here is that when you increase transparency, you actually decrease the likelihood for leaks to occur because the number one reason these large threatening leaks occur for national security is because of a lack of transparency. So that's the prerequisite. We control the link into that. But then on the green analysis, when they talk about the idea that media is going to be warped and that's going to warp public policy, realize the reason that the government is accountable to the people is because of the media. That's what SETI says. It's that it creates the link between the two. But then lastly, the green analysis tells us that we pulled out of Iraq because of the media. Now lastly on freedom and democracy. First on accountability, they never change policies if they never have information about it. On discourse, realize he tells you that it's polarized, or he tells you the idea that they still go to foreign publications. Well, 90% of the US media is owned by US companies. All that is watched by US people. So, uh, yeah, this article contends that a lack of legitimacy pervades U.S. government transparency laws, and that this legitimacy, de legitimacy deficit contributes to the risk of deluge leaks. Are you yes. aware of what deluge leaks are? What do you mean? I guess you can explain it to us. Sure, I can explain to you what a deluge leak is. Leaks, so. It is a large release of information. So, like, in the new age of data and the new encryptions and the new computer technology, there's large amount of data that can be stored on the surface. A deluge leak is a release of this large amount of information. That's what it is. Oh, okay. we argue so, that's so right. not necessarily damaging. So just this large doesn't mean. I mean, it's damaging so mainly because no, it's not. Right. That's not yeah, way it it doesn't say you get rid of threatening leaks okay. or damaging leaks. You just say leaks increase. So that's what really was let's, So let's yeah. let's ignore like the actual like specificity of okay, the bar yeah. and just go off the well, watch. Okay, let's let's Sam, Sam, Sam. If if leaks increase, that's important because it's not just damaging leaks. If leaks increase in our world, we win every impact of yours because you say, oh, leaks are important for accountability. Leaks are important. All of these things. It doesn't say damaging leaks. It just that's not true at all. Here, I mean, it's just large. No, no, let me explain. Because transparency goes down in your world, people who do deluge leaks are already really, really motivated. They've already gone through all the department standards and department conditions for talking about information. They've already brought all the problems to their superiors. Nothing will stop them now. Not even illegally publishing stuff. I mean, that's just saying just poor analysis. No, that's actually not just rhetoric. Everyone's anyone. Edward Snowden went through the authorized channels that you advocate for he just ten, ten times, times. and okay. then he and went to what the happened media. in 2014. We reformed the system. A lot of things happened in 2014. I mean, we reformed the system, but either way, we reformed we reform the system because of leaks. That's yeah. exactly no, what we're saying. If we didn't listen, know about it in the first listen, place, we never would have had the potential. I mean, you're, 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 that's our argument. You don't understand what we're saying. No, our argument is that. Evidence does not say damaging leaks. That's critical because it just says leaks increase. If leaks increase in the pro, we okay. gain your influence. Okay. Here's the thing: is the leaks that we advocate for are systematic, small, persistent leaks, and they not deluge leaks. Deluge leaks systematic, cover entire small, persistent leaks. Give me one. Uh, one example: Michael Ever. Flynn. That is not classified Check. information. All right, let's move on. That is not classified information. Deluge leaks. Deluge leaks are things like what Edward Snowden. What was classified by Michael Flynn? What was classified by Michael Flynn? Uh, the fact that he was handing our secrets over to yeah, the intelligence activities? Yes. No, okay, no, 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 no
of U.S. media is, like, a corporate, a U.S. corporations control U.S. media. That's not what the card says. The card says 90% of corporations control U.S. media markets. It doesn't say U.S. corporations. That's also critical because, like, you can still outsource to foreign publishers in our world, and people will still watch it. Foreign publishers are publishing classified information that is crucial because it wins every single impact that they talk about. They say you have to have accountability. You have to have discourse. You have to have legitimacy. If the Guardian or the Telegraph or WikiLeaks are doing the same thing, then you win all of their index. For example, Edward Snowden went to the Guardian in 2013. That's a UK publishing out, like the UK publishing outlet. And Chelsea Manning in 2010 went to WikiLeaks. Foreign publishing still occurs, and foreign publishing is better because it's not biased. It's not control. It's not like not like it has no incentive to blow up and sensationalize all the information like American news outlets do. That's why we show you the BuzzFeed dossier, which was completely falsified and harmed and polarized the American electorate, which stifles public policy. But now let's get to lies. We believe that we can best win lives off of our subpoint via of overcompensation, and he kind of lips on me and explain a little bit better. He says, that, like, the Iraq war was, like, the reason why we pulled out. The evidence doesn't say that we pulled out because of leaks. That's not at all what it says. Then recognize that this is just one example and doesn't prove a trend. Our argument is that whenever leaks occur, what happens is government officials feel very insecure. They feel very unsafe. Thus, they feel they must compensate, and oftentimes they overcompensate. What happens is military intervention occurs. That's why we extended Reagan, which got last. It says Reagan increases, like whenever you intervene, it increases the length of conflict by 1,000%. That links back to lives, save lives, over. One observation, two votes. Am I judging right? They never interact with Arisha's framework analysis he gives you in summary, in which he says the prerequisite to caring for lives per the government is that the government is accountable for its people. Therefore, if you believe that government accountability decreases in an affirmative world subsequently, the government will decrease their respect for the care of human life. At that point, they lose the only link to their actual impact. Even more so, let's go into the first voter, which is all about security. They dropped a lot of evidence throughout this round. The first comes from Perry, which says, the United States is the gold standard of evidence. They never talk to you about how much we rely on other countries, nor what the absence of that information does to our policy. At that point, there's no terminal impact to this argument. Second, from Hague completely non-unique to their security point, their second contention, the thing he goes all in on in his final focus because it says in the status quo, in the negative world, right now it is illegal to publish classified information that directly harms national security. What they're talking about is already illegal. They never give you a unique reason for why you need to further restrict the press with an affirmative ballot. And the most critical piece of evidence is the green analysis, which he just says doesn't say what I want it to say. It literally says that because of leaks, the stage was set up for the United States to finally exit the war in Iraq. This is a cold turn to the only impact he has, because contrary to what his debate logic might say, the reason we left Iraq was because our human rights abuses and our systematic malpractices were exposed to the American people, and subsequently, we put political pressure on them. That political pressure is what leads me to my second voter point, which is democracy. What Norris finds is that small systematic leaks enable the United States citizens to have checks on the government and influence policy. Bain finds that leaks enable discourse, and discourse is what drives policy changes in American democracy. Even more so, what they advocate for is operating behind closed doors, which only enables abuses. The only way that they say they saw back for this is whistleblowers, yet they never respond to the analysis that we give throughout this round, in which they concede that the government will never self-expose their wrongdoings. At that point, we have no reason to trust the government in order to give us our information. Even more so, they say, we'll go to foreign media, but our card legitimately says the six 
U.S. corporations control 90% of media. At that point, foreign media doesn't play a role. This key piece of analysis comes from SETI, which says the American press is fundamental in the dissemination of information, and that's what fuels democracy. Thus, I urge you to negate and preserve democracy. Thank you.